Good afternoon. Today is May 28, 2014, and we are interviewing Jerry Jules at the, at the Adams County Courthouse in Quincy, Illinois. Mr. Jules is 64 years old, having been born on February 6, 1950. Is that correct? Correct. My name is Laura Keck, and I'll be the interviewer. Mr. Jules, could you state for the recording what war and branch of service you served in? I was in the United States Army in 1968 to 1971 and I was in the United States Army. And what rank were you? Sergeant E-5. And during that time when you were in the U.S. Army, where did you serve? I, I took basic training in uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, AIT at Fort Ord, California. Went to Vietnam for one year, 69-70. Then I spent the remainder of a year and a half at Fort Hood, Texas. So you were in Vietnam for one year? Yes. While you were there, did you get immersed in the culture where you were stationed? What do you mean? Did you um, get to meet any of the people there that were from there? Some. Some. Not a lot. It was on the other end I was on, but okay. I, I got to visit with some of them, yes. Um, what, if any, mementos did you bring back from your time there? Do I, can I show you? Or? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, I had that same question that, that you asked me when I got back, and my first answer was my momentum was me because I was lucky to come back alive. Mm -hmm. But uh, I carried this cross they gave me as a Protestant. I had that, and there's my P-30 weight, which is a can opener. And I have carried, got my dog tag, but this is a cross that I had. It's uh, another cross that I carried. I had two crosses there. Those three things, and this watch. This watch was in Vietnam with me, too. Really? Yes. It's been cleaned five or six times, <laughs> but it's the same watch. Okay. And I have, uh, you've probably never seen these. These are called cachettes. Uh-uh. And they're fired from a, a round, and they splatter through the air, which, you know, what their purpose is is to kill the VC. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but... No. And can you say that again? Cachettes. Cachettes, I mean. And how do you spell that? It's F-L-E-C-H-E-T-T-E-S. Hmm. Now, what was your job or assignment while you were over there? When I first got there, I was a rifleman. And then I carried uh, M79, which is a grenade launcher. And then I become platoon sergeant, acting platoon sergeant when I was over there. And I had my own squad for them quite long, six, six months, seven months anyway, so I was 18 when I first got there, turned 19 after several days that I was there, but I had college, I was only 18, 19, and I had college grads that was 25, 26 years old that I was over, so that's what I was, squad leader. As squad leader, what were your duties for people who might not know? Okay, I, when we'd go out on ambush, there'd be like seven or eight or nine of us, however it was. And we'd go out, and I'd, we'd go out so many clicks, and uh, which is, you know, meters or whatever you want to call it, and uh, set up perimeter, and our company would be in the back, and we would make sure the enemy wouldn't come into the into the company, so. And you would be in charge of the, that group of people? Yeah, the, the squad, yes. Yes. Did you see combat while you were over there? Yes, ma'am. Did you have any casualties from your unit? Yes. Just in my company when I was there, there's 32 got killed, and I'm going to say probably 300 got wounded. Did you yourself have any injuries? Yes. What injuries did you have? Walked into a minefield. Me and the squad walked into a minefield, and uh, there was nine, two killed, and seven wounded. Is that when you were went home? No, I never did go home. I, went, I was sent to Black Horse Hospital for four or five days, and then I went back to the field. So... Uh, we walked into a minefield, and, and to this day, I'm still trying to get a Purple Heart. Really? Yes. And matter of fact, I'm working on it right this day we're talking about it. So hmm. they say it was non-hostile action, but, you know, we was out in the middle of a jungle. And, <laughs> you know, we don't know who set the mines. They think the French years and years and years ago set the minefields out there, but there was no signs, nothing. We walked right to that minefield. And, I already, I already made it to the minefield because there was elephant grass that was about four or five foot tall. Point man and me, 
we made it through the minefield. I'm saying the minefield. And uh, I heard an explosion behind me. And another explosion. So I went, turned around. That's when I got wounded, too. We laid out there three or four hours before they could get help. And we got to the tanks, you know, that I showed you. They helped get us out of there because nobody could walk into the minefield. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. Were they able to get everyone at once? Mm -hmm. Had to take two different times to get us out of there, but it took a long time. Mm-hmm. Are there any other experiences like that or other experiences that you remember specifically? Well, I can name you hundreds, but... Um, Another thing was we found a cache. My unit did. We found it was 30 ton, and she's got the pictures of it, night and she's getting it documented. But we found rice and beans and gas, and we was one of the biggest caches found in South Vietnam, which is in Three Corps, and, and I explained that. And uh, what we did, we it took us four days to get everything loaded out. What we did, we loaded on Chinooks, and they hauled it out of there, and then they dis distributed it to Saigon, to the people in Saigon, and to the villages around there, which probably uh, probably got reissued to the VC, the Viet Cong out there. So, you know, it, the war was, uh, I don't know, there, there was no front lines. So one day you'd see the enemy and talk to him, if you did the next night, you the same night you'd be fighting him. So hmm. now this cache um, for people who might not know, if you can explain for the video what that means. A cache is like an abundance of stuff you can find. Like if you found a cache of gold or something like that. Mm -hmm. But this was, you know, the VC buried it and hid it in the jungle. So we was walking through the jungle. My well, it was my whole company that was walking through, and we found that. And it was one of the biggest caches found in in South Vietnam. Really? Yep. Now, we talked a little bit about how um, you're waiting for the Purple Heart. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Yes, I was. Um, what were those? We left them over there, didn't we? I can't tell you every one of them, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> did you get that back page, too? You didn't, did you? I didn't. Okay. Well, I got, I got a bronze medal, four bronze stars. And uh, you've got National Defense Combat Infantry Badge, which I'm very proud of. And um, Good Conduct Medal, Army Commendation Medal. And there was three more, four more. I had nine medals altogether. I can't remember what they were. That what, Combat what. Infantry Medal you said you're really proud of, what was that for? For serving in combat. Okay. So you got that. right there. Oh, okay. And uh, I got an Air Medal. Which is an air medal is if you had 50 hours in the air, they call them eagle flights we was on. And what they would do is load maybe in like 9 or 10, take a whole company out and take it out to a hot LZ or to in the middle of a jungle or somewhere. They'd drop us off, stay out there four or five days, have food, whatever we need. We had our seed rations with us. And we would go through the jungles and try to protect Saigon because right when I got there, Tet Offensive was just over, which was the worst time around mm -hmm. Saigon. I mean... My unit killed like 900 BC then, and uh, I got there at the end of that, and uh, so that's what we was doing, trying to protect Saigon from being overrun by communists, the the BC over there. So, and uh, we had like 30 or 40 mile radius around Saigon. We we guarded that was jungle and rice paddies. This is kind of kind of switch gears a little bit. How did you get along with the officers and your fellow soldiers? Officers, some of them was okay, some of them not, because I had one captain that uh, we got a picture being taken of that, you know, he accused me of, you know, of killing one of my own guys, in which I did not. I mean, we walked in from ambush I was telling you about. We'd walk in. The VC followed us in, and that was when we found that 30-ton cache. And he was out relieving himself. He was about maybe, you know, re we had a perimeter that was circled as much as you could get. And we went out like so many clicks out there on ambush. And when we come back in, I heard something to my left. 
but I couldn't tell what it was. So we walked right on in. When we walked in, we had uh, the guy was probably about 30 yards from me, and they opened up fire on him first before they got to us. So they killed him, which was, was probably one of my best buddies I had there. And then there was another guy, his name was Jim Wolf, and he was beside me. He got shot right in the middle of the back, and I pulled him behind a tree. And we was in grass probably two foot tall, and we was pinned down for I don't know how long, but it looked like a lawnmower come through and mowed that, all that grass around there and the trees and everything. We got hit hard. I bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, and while you were there, did you feel any pressure or stress or anxiety? 365 days. Every, Every day. day. I slept with one eye open and one eye shut. And to this day, I still do. Since that time? Yep. I uh, sleep at night, and I sleep with the windows open, and I can actually almost hear a snake going through the grass. I'm a light sleeper. Mm -hmm. And I am taking, I got PTSD, and, uh, and I mean, I'm taking med medications for it, and it does help, but it doesn't solve the problem all the way. But Are you able to sleep through the night? I do if I don't have if I have a bad dream then I then I wake up and then I'm awake for quite a while. And the bad dreams aren't quite as bad as they used to be, but they was really bad for a long time. I really drank a lot when I come back and abuse my body and fight and whatever. I you know I just didn't care and uh, I'm kind of getting over all that stuff, but I still bad dreams are still there. Mm -hmm. Did you keep a diary while you were over there? No. Were you able to stay in touch with your family? Whenever I could. When, uh, I would write mom and dad and some relatives, but, you know, when you're out in combat and you're out in the middle of a bush and you're, and you're in monsoon and it rains six months out of the year, you can't write a letter, you know. And then when I was wounded, I couldn't. I didn't write. I was, you know, in the hospital for a week there. But I, there would be times I didn't write for three or four weeks at home to home because you just can't write a letter when you're out in the monsoon, raining and because you only had a little poncho to slip over your head to keep dry, so. Did they send you letters? Yeah, I got letters, yes. Did you do or um, have anything special for good luck? No. Well, these two crosses, and that was it. And you had those the whole time you were over there? Yes, yes. Did you have plenty of supplies during that year? No. What did you run out of? Run out of food sometimes. We'd run out of ammunition once in a while, and uh, all the food, you know, we'd, we'd carry like three or four days supply. We had 40, 50, 60 pounds of gear on our back, and then walking through mud and rain and rivers and this and that. And there was a couple of days I'd go out without food, and then water was very critical. I had no water. We had to go to the rivers and get the water, and that's where the, uh, the Vietnamese people did you know took their baths and we mm -hmm. had and went to the rest bathrooms in the river and that's where we had to purify the water in the streams and drink your drinking water yes that was it yes purification tablets and then we took my malaria tablets and salt tablets every day what was the food like sea rations to this day i don't eat applesauce because <laughs> i had applesauce every day for but uh i never really did get heavy have very many hot meals, like I would say, you know, where you get back to the rear. I get back to the rear maybe once every seven, eight days, maybe. But the sea rations, you can heat them up, but it was warm. But, you know, it was just cans that was old, 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 but it was food. How did you entertain yourself while you were there? I entertained myself from hiding underneath dikes and behind bushes and stuff. There, I, I didn't have it really made over there. I It was... You know, the only time I had it made, I would say, is when I went back, uh, when I took an R&R &R and went back to, I went to Australia. So. And when you went to Australia, how long did you go? Five days. Were you able to kind of relax then? Yeah. What did you do there? Went to a few bars and, and kind of sat around and just kind of took it easy. That's, you know, that was, we, when we got there and we was sprayed with some, I don't know what they sprayed us with, but we we had real bad body odor, you know, because we never got showers, mm -hmm. hardly never got a change of clothes. You know, you might go a week without a change of clothes. And if you don't wash, your skin gets kind of yellowish and kind of smelly, you know, without, you know, no underarm deodorant or anything like that, you know. And 
we did some out. We, we got back to the rear sometimes and we'd go to an NCO club, which is a non-commissioned officer club, and uh, they kick us out because we stunk so bad. Oh. And which is, I mean, they, you know, we, we didn't smell the best. I mean, we did the best we could do, but you just can't take no bath or showers out when you're out in the middle of the jungle. So, um, there any times that either you or other people would pull pranks? No, I never pulled one prank over there. I, there might have been some pulled, but no, I did not. No. I took my job very serious over there. Did you bring any photos you would like to share and tell us about? Uh, I have a couple. Okay. That, you know, I I got a whole book here, but I I'll just show you uh, my squad. Do you want to see? Sure. sure. Can I come over there? I'm gonna have you actually do it right here, and then we can, the camera okay. can see it too. Put it. I don't have. I got a bunch of gonna, pictures, but I'm just gonna show you three. Let me hold it like that. Yes, we can see. I don't know which one we're going to do. I this one right here. Okay. This is my squad. You need to okay, see this one. Why don't I just hold it for you both can see it? Okay. Let's get, make sure it's on the video here. Okay. Let me scoot it just. Oh, yeah, I can see it. Perfect. Okay. This is my squad. Let's just Sorry. Okay. I would take it out Perfect. of there, but I can't take them out of there. They're All dying right. so long. It should work now if you want to show okay. them. Okay. Uh, he got killed in a minefield with me. He was one that got killed. Gagney, Wolf, he got shot in the back. Jika, my machine gun man. And he'd walk point for me sometimes. Uh, here I am before I went on ambush one night. I was carrying an M79, which is a grenade launcher. And how old were you at this time? I just turned 19. And there's one other picture. I mean, there's a bunch of pictures. Some of them you may not like to see, but and when I got out of with two weeks left in Vietnam, I went to a mountain called Signal Mountain, which hill is Hill 837. It's north of Saigon, and my, they took me out of field because they called the short timers. Short timers is when you only got maybe two or three weeks left, so you don't get killed. So and uh, that's what I did. I took squads out. I carried a 45, and I took three or four people with me. These are Bangalore torpedoes, and we'd go down and blow jungle around that whole mountain, so so we could see the VC because this was one of the tallest mountains in Vietnam. <clears throat> in Vietnam, so and we had uh, Australians up there, Koreans up there, and so were other short timers there with you? Or yes. You? Okay. A lot of short timers, and and my unit, which is 199th Infantry. They, uh, this was one of our jobs when we become short timers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the day that your service ended? From Vietnam or from when I got out of the Army completely? Both of them. I remember very, yeah. When I come back home from Vietnam, which was uh, like, January the 30th or 31st, I can't remember. I got two days early out. So, uh, yeah, I remember it was, people was kind of happy and talking, you know. It wasn't like when I went there, because there, you could have heard a pin drop on the way over there. Mm -hmm. And so on the way back, people was, you know, I just sat and just thought about what kind of hell I've been through, you know. A lot of them did too, though. And then when I got out of the Army, I would have stayed in when I got out in 71, because I, I did like the Army. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to go to the Army in the first place because I was uh, uh, had, I had a knee operation and my knee kept me from going in, but I had to get two doctor's permits to go in. So I said I wanted to go in. The doctor said, you don't have to, but I enlisted for three years. And then I didn't have to go to Vietnam neither because I'm a sole surviving son. I have no brothers or sisters. So, oh. so if I got killed, nobody would have carried the name on. But uh, I didn't have to go to the service at all. But And I would have stayed in. When I got out in September 71, but I couldn't make it in Nam another year. I don't think I'd have made it alive, so mm -hmm. I was just lucky. So, um, When you left Vietnam, what was was it because your year was up? Or? Yes, right. Yep. Um, once you did get out of the service, what did you do in the days and weeks afterwards? Well, I kind of took it easy for a while. I had a girlfriend in Texas, so I went back to Texas when I got out of Fort Hood over there, which is Colleen or Temple. 
And then I'd stay there maybe a month. I'd come back home for a month. I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. My life was still kind of goofed up. So I went back to Texas, come back home, went back to Texas, come back home. And you were still pretty young then? Yes. How old were you, would you have been then? At? 22. 22. So I uh, ended up coming back to Golden, Illinois, and I stayed there. Did you go back to school at any no. time? That was one reason I went in service, because a lot of my buddies, they was going to college and stuff, and I didn't want to go to school. And then one of the guys I didn't run around with, he got killed in Vietnam that I graduated with me, Mike Freeze, and he's from Fowler over here, and uh, he got killed right after I left. Did you make any cl close friendships while you were there? Yeah. Right now, we, since 19 or 2005, I've been meeting with five Vietnam veterans that was in our same, same platoon and same company. And so we meet once a year. We go to different places. We're going to Indiana this year, mm -hmm. and there's one from uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Missouri, and I'm from Illinois. And there's another one from uh, Galveston, Texas, and another one from uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And you go every year to a different place? Yeah. Um, did you join any veterans organizations? Yes, I'm a lifetime member of the VFW, and I'm a lifetime member of the uh, American Legion. And what kinds of things do you do with those organizations? Okay, like as uh, today, Wednesday, Monday, I had military services. I am head of uh, military funerals, give the commands, and during, like, at uh, the Memorial Day service, I'll give commands to the guys and stuff, so. Mm -hmm. And then at VFW, I'm not the commander there, but I... I'm on the rifle squad. How do you think your service and experiences affected your life? It put a big dent in it. I grew up pretty fast, even though people thought I was a spoiled little brat being the only child, you know, but they don't think that anymore, you know, because mm -hmm. war is hell, so, you know, it's a, uh, but it really affected me because I, I, there ain't probably a day that goes by that I don't think about Vietnam. Probably not, you know, either there's the sun hits me wrong, the rain, the humidity, the smell, or the loud sounds. Something happens every day that brings me back to Vietnam. Every day. Has anyone ever thanked you for your service? Not as much as I would have liked to have once in a while, but, you know, when I come back, there was no parties, no one to thank you. You know, I come back, and my family had a meal for me, which I don't have a very big family, and I got a hug, but uh, no, I nothing. Did your experience influence your thinking about war or military in general? Mm -hmm. How is that? When I volunteered for Vietnam, I thought, you know, this isn't going to be that bad. But boy, when I got over there, the minute I got off that plane, the 110 degree heat and the smell just, it'll stick in your mind forever. Mm -hmm. It's uh, something you'll never forget. Even just them two things right there, it was hot. <laughs> it was hot. Do you encourage people to enlist in the military now? Yes, I do. I think there is a place for anyone in the military because even if they have one one leg or whatever, they still need people to run typewriters or computers or things like that, you know, and there's a job for everyone in the service, you know, I, to me there is. And mm -hmm. not because I did this or did that, but, uh, you know, I don't have hard feelings really against the guys. Like in my day when they went to Canada or somewhere, you know, and they took off, didn't have a problem with them going, but I do have a problem with them coming back. I don't think they should be a United States citizen. If they didn't want to fight for our country, mm -hmm. then why come back, you know? But I had no hard feelings at the time. How do you feel about the way that war is depicted in movies? There's a couple movies, and I don't like to watch them too much, but there's a couple movies that are pretty pretty well hit it right on the head. Not quite, but, you know, there's that, that's actors for you. But, you know, there's a couple of them that are pretty good. There's... I wish there was more documentation made of Vietnam that, you know, like we're going through this experience, really talk to somebody that's really been there and go through the experiences they've been through before they make a movie instead of 
John Wayne doing it, you know, and you know, he's a good actor, but. <laughs> right. Um, what about, do you think about the way that they teach war and history in the schools? I took history in school. And I guess I didn't pay a lot of attention to it because I thought I'd never be involved in that time. I was a junior in high school when I took American history. I love history. Uh, I like hearing about it and stuff, and history to this day interests me, but um, Vietnam was a different cat. Mm -hmm. It was just a different cat. What was the most positive thing that you had from your experience? From Vietnam? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I, I guess, I guess really, I am really proud of myself for what I did. I'm not embarrassed on some of the things I had to do. I had to uh, shoot people, and um, that's life when you're in combat. So it may be a better person in life because I appreciate God. Mm -hmm. And what about what was the most negative thing? War is not fun, and especially when I come home and then they say it was a police action or whatever, you know, they said it wasn't a war. Why did we go over there and fight if it wasn't a war? You know, that really sticks in my mind. This is our police action, whatever they want to call it. We, could, we never won over there. Everything we did, we won, but when we come back, the, for not because the communism took over South Vietnam anyway. They mm -hmm. took over again, so, you know, we lost almost 59,000 guys over there. And I I got to think why when we give everything up and, you know, we fought battles and we won. Mm -hmm. We won over there, but we lost because of the politics involved. What were your most memorable experiences that you remember? Uh, Australia would be one mm -hmm. when I went on R&R. &R. Um, I didn't have a lot of laughs over there. I, I, I can think of a lot of things that happened over there, but a lot of guys got to go on R and R. They would maybe go two or three times. You know, I never never got to go. When I was going on R and R, there was another guy with me, and he was married. And uh, he said, "Well, I sure like to go see my wife in Hawaii." And I said, "I don't have anybody to see, so just take my place, and I'll go to Australia, and you go to Hawaii see your wife." So, you know, I was happy that he got to see his okay. wife. So, but uh. And that's, and there just wasn't a really good, happy, happy times over there. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have these reunions, um, what kinds of things do you do with the guys? We sit around and talk, just the guys do. We bring us some things that I didn't do over there that they might have done. You know, I might have been on R&R &R or something like that and talk about guys that we was with. Like, she's got pictures of some guys we was with that got killed. And uh, we talk about that. We go on hikes, we kind of talk mm -hmm. and mosey. We don't, you know, I'm the baby of the group. I'm 64, but, you know, they're 66, 67, 68. You know, they're older than me, so we're getting older and older, but it doesn't seem that way. Mm -hmm. But um, we just sit around and reminisce and do things we want to do, and they like to go boating and things like that, canoeing, I mean. And so we have a good time talking. I mean, we only see each other for maybe three or four days out of the year, but it seems like I've known them all my life and they're probably my best buddies even more I had in high school. So, And how did you reconnect to organize this in 2005? I didn't, I didn't get it. The, our medic did. He was our, our medic and his name is Richard Hurst and he's from uh, Lancaster, Ohio. And he started wanting to get with his buddies and uh, he started getting on the internet and things like that and finding out people here and there. And he found this one and found that one. And, I had a guy in St. Louis that remembered me, and he got a hold of me. So hmm. they felt really found me. I did find them. So. And do you stay in contact throughout the year? Anyway? Yes. Yeah. How we'll, do you do we'll that? We'll talk by phone. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk probably once a month, maybe to each one of them or so. Is there anything else that you've been thinking about that you wanted to add that we haven't talked about? No, I th I think you covered a lot. I mean, you know, it's. I just feel privileged to come here and talk to you too. I really do. You know, it, 
it hits I, it hits me kind of hard on some things we talk about, but you know that's just the way I do every day. So, but still, it's uh, I'm glad this is being done because you know I haven't got the Vietnam guys never got a lot of recognition. We never did, and this is one way to do it. So, well, we really appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you.